it's your, your turn now, I think. Uh, just those ground rules again. If uh, uh, you need a microphone, uh, can you uh, attract my attention? Um, uh, can you, uh, yep, yeah, can the first microphone go to uh, that gentleman there? Uh, can you say um, uh, who you are? Uh, and if it's relevant, the organisation you come from, and also if there's a particular panellist you want to answer the question. Uh, yeah, my name's Nigel Rothband. I'm the chief executive of uh, the retail charity Retail Trust. Uh, during my retail career, I was very fortunate to work with the late, great Dame Anita Roddick at the Body Shop. And when Anita opened her first store 30 years ago, she was encouraging customers to recycle their bottles, uh, she only sourced community traded products and every single customer was asked if they needed a bag. Why on earth has it taken the largest brands in the world to catch up with what Anita was doing 30 years ago? Very nice. That's punctured the mood of <laughs> self-congratulation. <laughs> well, who should we start? Well, it'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Uh, um, uh, well, Harry, we'll, we can leave you out of this, can't we? Uh, no, I want you to... I... No, no, not you first. Let's, 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 get the, uh, the, <laughs> let's, let's get the targets to answer uh, 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 first. Uh, you first, Richard, I'm afraid. Um, great question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't honestly think it has. Certainly on some of the, some of the issues you say there, of course it has. But for a number of years now, issues that appear and were clearly important to Anita at that time with that, with that visionary position that she took um, didn't appear to be as important to mainstream retailers as they responded to consumers who said, we don't see it as that important either and we just want to pay less for our products and we want to, we want to follow the 80s and 90s buzz of, of, of more consumption. I think as education, the understanding of the impact of that kind of behaviour has begun to, to spread across society, then the consumer is beginning to change and the, and the businesses are responding to that uh, in, in, in increasingly rapid ways. You've seen four big international businesses here who have now effectively taken much of what Anita was saying to heart and included it as part of their DNA as they see the relevance on a mass scale, not just about uh, servicing a niche market and a niche group of consumers. David, briefly, if you would. It's an interesting question, actually. You know, and it probably is true to say over 30 years that ethical has moved from the niche into, into, into more of the uh, into, into more of the mainstream. I mean, I'm sort of I've been thinking about motivation of Tesco in moving particularly, I, I've sort of been honest and said our journey was particularly a, a climate change CO2 journey and, and what led Tesco from, you know, to, 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 to really, really to accelerate I, I, its actions in that area uh, was the data and I, and I remember spending, a sort of, spending an hour or so a few years ago wondering how far behind the data we were as a business. In other words, should we have started our, our climate strategy in roughly about 2007? And it depends how pessimistic you want to get. I mean, you know, you could have started it in 1897, which would have put Anita somewhere behind, behind, you know, behind the trajectory. Um, I think we are where we are, and, uh, and, and we're doing our best. John? I think it's uh, pretty simple. She was a visionary, and there were other visionaries that had other similar uh, approaches to these, uh, if you want to call them niches, and frankly, it's taken a long time for mass marketeers to recognize the importance. I think it's really that, that simple. Tim? Nothing, nothing of substance to add. I mean, she was a trailblazer, fantastic. I'm not a big fan of managing through the rear view mirror. I think it's about going forward now and embracing the imperative and the opportunity. Uh, Harriet, uh, there's a couple of questions uh, from the adjoining rooms, uh, question cards. So, uh, uh, this is from uh, Lawrence Harris, who's an organic mixed dairy farmer in the UK, of course, for you, Harriet. Um, will there ever be a situation when fair trade principles are applied to UK farmers? Uh, and he adds, the average age of UK farmers is 58. Did you say, um, <laughs> did, did you say the average age of, uh, of cocoa uh, farmers in Ghana was 56? Indeed, I did. And uh, actually... Well done, Lawrence. <laughs> We had a very wonderful experience when a dairy farmer from Cumbria went out to meet the Windward Island banana farmers. And he came back and he, uh, we held a conference uh, full of farmers in Cumbria where he shared his experience. And he said, I went out thinking we were the developed world. And when I met the banana farmers and I saw the way they'd organized and they'd started to work together in groups to begin to change their position in the supply chain, I, I was completely humbled. 
And his message back was, how can we, the dairy farmers here in Britain, also get organised in that same way so that we can begin to change our position in the supply chain? From a fair trade point of view, we have looked long and hard about should we do fair trade for uh, farmers in the, in the rich world. And we decided not to in the end for three reasons. The standards would have to be changed so much they were almost unrecognisable. The public completely associate our mark with the relief of absolute poverty, with farmers who literally don't have schools, don't have clean drinking water, don't have health facilities, which is different. It's not to deny the problem of farmers in the UK, but it's a different level of scale. And finally, the farmers uh, with the, who own Fairtrade, they're part owners, and we had a meeting about it, and there was an orange juice farmer, and he took his pen, and he was so angry, he threw it down on the table until it broke, and he said, the day that Europe and the USA reform the common agricultural policy, get rid of all your unfair uh, tariffs, your escalating tariffs, your unfair trade subsidies, that's the day you can do fair trade for farmers here at home as well. And when do you, the question was, when do you imagine that will be? I think it will be some decades in the future. So it's not never, but we've got so much to do to tackle poverty in developing countries. We've got to, to the question, keep our focus. But we would wish all the best to dairy farmers to get on and do something here without the fair trademark, but get on and make fair milk a reality here in Britain. Uh, David, a question that uh, I think, well, it isn't specific. Well, it is because it mentions you. An anonymous <laughs> question, anonymous question, in fact, but the writing's different, so I think it's genuine. Um, uh, the regular focus on consumer sustainability, retail trend in creating recyclable packaging. But what about the huge amount of unnecessary packaging that's expected to be used in the supply of companies such as Tesco? Shelf-ready packs, etc. Uh, how do the big retail giants propose to reduce this trend and expectation, which creates more wastage and is not even relative, doesn't even help marketing as the consumer doesn't even see it? The anonymous question always instills fear in me, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, th there's been, a, I mean, for those of you who are not familiar, there's been a, there's, there's a big debate within the retail and the manufacturing sector about this thing called retail-ready packaging. And, and uh, the retailers historically, I mean, Richard will know more than I do about it, but the retailers have traditionally been in favor of it because it saves on labor in particular. You can just basically shove it onto the shelf is, is, is the theory. The manufacturers have generally not been in favour of it, uh, I think on the basis that the argument being that, that, that manufacturers generally have to bear more cost as a result, whether it's the cost of, of labour or the cost of packaging, uh, and also that it, that, it, that it increases packaging as well. And I, that, that debate's been going on, going on for years. I'm, what I'm not sure about is, is, what the, you know, is, is where it has got to at the moment and how committed um, retailers continue to be about retail-ready packaging, but but it's a it's a long industry debate. This. Okay. Um, uh, uh, anybody in that particular block? Yeah. Um, yes, Roger Cousins, uh, Green Acres Consultancy. Uh, we work in consultancy in uh, sustainable agriculture in Africa and Asia, and are rising to the challenge, as was mentioned earlier, of the need for 70, 80 percent increase in food production by 2050. Um, my question is, uh, is it sustainable because the other part of the equation is how much of that production has been wasted and um, it hasn't really been discussed and I would like to know the panel's opinion about food waste when it arrives here in the West um, because there's a lot of cost and a lot of carbon involved in getting that food here and processed and on the shelf and so how can we uh, address the problem of food waste? Uh, Tim, can I start with you? Certainly. I mean, uh, as part of our overall, as, as we refer to it, sustainability wheel around, you know, water, waste, energy, packaging, and transportation, and agri-commodities, those are the six key measures that we scorecard ourselves against. And one of them is, is waste. And so it's, uh, we have very specific targets and, you know, KPIs, uh, key, key indicators, um, and we are looking for consistent reduction of waste year after year. I, I have to say from the agri-commodity standpoint, as you referenced earlier, in terms of cocoa or coffee, inbound uh, agri-commodities, uh, our waste is very low. That's uh, far less of an issue. The waste for us tends to be in the packaging arena, and that's where we're focused because that has the greatest impact. John, you, you actually, you've, you've probably addressed most of this in talking about your use of water and so on. Uh, 
Have you got more general thoughts on this? Just that we continue to work very closely with our suppliers, and particularly, for example, beet sugar uh, suppliers on things we can do and things they can do mm. to reduce waste. It's a very active part of the program. Har Harriet, this is uh, some of the statistics about waste in this more general, you know, waste at the farm end, uh, particularly, really, or in, in, the, in the way that uh, the, the, the early stages of the supply chain. Some of the statistics are quite extraordinary, aren't they? Well, right through, it's quite astounding. And I think, mm. according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, something like one third of all food is wasted. Mm. Now, some of that is a consequence that farmers don't have proper storage facilities, mm. there isn't proper infrastructure to get products to market quickly. So, that's absolutely about tackling the needs in developing countries. And some of it, I think, is the flip side of driving prices down for consumers and offering buy one, get one free, and offering so that actually people buy more food than they can consume and they have to throw it away. And we've, because we've driven prices down so hard, it's perhaps less valued, and therefore people pile their basket high and end up having to throw a lot away. Yeah. So I think we can tackle it at both ends. And indeed, as, as much food is wasted as the whole of sub-Saharan Africa eats. So I think if we want to tackle the food crisis, it's absolutely about addressing that imbalance between the poverty and the affluence, so that we have more than enough food to feed the world. It's just not going in the right place. I, I want a, a, a create room for one last question from the floor here, David, but uh, Harry's got a point there. I mean, I mean, I go to Tesco's and sometimes I see, uh, <coughs> you know, a ham or whatever it is, a, a, a carton of ham, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's two pounds, or if you buy two of them, it's... Uh, you know, uh, quite a substantial saving. And I am guilty of, of this as well. I thought, well, you know, yeah. my wife's going to love this. Buy, buy the two of them, and they end up throwing one of them away. Yeah, I think, I think Harriet, uh, Harriet does have a, have a point on that. Um, there is, as, as Tim was saying, if you, if you look at the actual production for, 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 for big global brands, um, very little waste, and, and, and uh, you know, we can, we can be confident about that. There is some waste at the consumer end. I think retailers collectively have got a bit better at it in, in recent years. So, for example, varying the, the, the number of things you can buy. when you, so it's buy, you can buy one and get one free of something else so that, so that you, you, you've got a bit more of a chance of being able to but, use but, it if you're not a big family. Sorry, you're but, getting round to Roger's point, actually, which was more about the waste, I think, at the, uh, at the, at the early stages well, of, it, of all this. It, yeah. Roger's point wasn't. It was the reverse. But I was, I was going to disagree with Roger with respect, which, sorry, is, which, I, is to pick up, which is to pick up Harriet's point which is actually, if you look at the data, um, if we really want to get close to Tim's challenge of a 70% increase in food production by 2050, you've got to start where it is being wasted on a massive scale for all sorts of infrastructure reasons, which is at the production scale. Roger, do you want to come back very quickly? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, just to clarify. My point was just that, that the um, waste in the West is higher than I think many people uh, assume is uh, acceptable. And the, point Harriet made was the one I was trying to make too. Okay, excellent. Thank you. There's room for just one more question. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nick Porter. Um, I think it's a really fascinating debate today. Um, there's a key statistic, though, that I think is really pertinent. The 70% increase in food production required by 2050. What do we as a business community and governments need to do to accelerate the sustainability that you, you guys are driving? Because there's a real sense that it's not, we're not actually getting there, it's still quite slow, it's, you know, the world's becoming a less sustainable place. Um, briefly, if you would, uh, and this is the last answer from all of you. Tim, would you mind starting? Certainly. It's, uh, again, it, it goes back to leadership, um, critically investment. I mean, we have to put our euros, dollars, and pounds where our mouth is. And it does require an investment. And uh, f for some of us, it requires a, a leap of faith. It, it sounds like some of us have seen quick ROI uh, uh, paybacks. Um, I, we all need to be confident that the ROI will be there in the long term. The math dictates it as an absolute imperative. So I think it's investment as, as an industry if we come together. And then again, it's about NGOs and governments as well. It is a partnership. It's at origin countries and it's at consuming countries. It's about you know, raising the standards, bringing additional science to bear in the science of growing uh, cocoa crops. There's been far less science applied to that than in so many other things around the world, particularly in these uh, equatorial crops. They, they have been neglected in terms of the science behind it. So in the end, it's about leadership, it's about investment, and it's about industry and government working together. 
John, briefly, if you would. Well said. There's not a lot to add to that. I mean, it's leadership, it's governments, it's business, and it's significant investment in technology. David? Uh, collaborate. I think you've got five organizations up here, but if you then look down the supply chain, you've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of suppliers. I mean, what your question earlier on, Michael, about whether small, if you look at a small producer in, 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 uh, you know, in, in a developing country and they want to address a sustainability challenge, they need our help to do so. We will, as, as Tim was saying earlier, only be able to help if we do it on a collaborative basis rather than, than as individual businesses. Richard? Um, I think it's real focus and, and if I was to add anything, it's about consumption as well as production. The number at 70% assumes we will continue to consume and waste a third. And I think there is a real opportunity for us to continue the journey of consumer understanding, consumer education, consumer acceptance and participation in this journey. Harriet, last word with you. Everyone's been saying it's about leadership, which I think is right. The problem with that is, what about the vast majority of companies who are not embracing sustainability all around the world? And I think there are key things. I think the city is another part we haven't talked about, investors and their absolute drive for short-term return as opposed to being willing to give companies time longer to build a real long-term value. I absolutely think also it's about government, as everyone has said, and really dramatic action to reform the global trade structures. Because at the end of the day, it was Gandhi who said, the world has enough for everyone's need, not enough for everyone's greed. And if we go back as we're ending, as it's the Olympics, back to where you started and the fantastic job the Olympics have done on making this the greenest ever Olympics. And let's really hope that the amazing job they did in making sure from the recycling through to the tea and the coffee being fair trade, that that does have a legacy in really helping push the sustainability issues further forward. OK, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your interest and your involvement. But please thank the panel.